Sorry about that. God's grace and peace to you. It is so good to be back with you. I am back on Sundays and preaching. I am not 100% yet, so I may not be back in the office. If you need me, please don't hesitate to call my cell phone. Um, so still recovering, but glad to be back, and I sure missed y'all. We have a couple of special announcements. I know that it's Suds of Love this week, and all volunteers would be welcome to help. Sherry, you have something? Ooh. Good morning, everybody. Can you guess what I want to talk about? Christmas parade. <laughs> we are number 18 in the Concord Parade. Um, you guys might think, 18, what's that mean? We're not at the back. We don't have to wait as long. Um, there has been some um, brainstorming for decorating of our float. Um, I know that Heather asked if anybody has any pool noodles, if you could donate them to the church. Also, if you would like to help us decorate the float, we will be here Friday, Heather, at 7, 7 p.m. Pool noodles. Yes. Anything else, Cheryl, for donations? Okay. All right, Pat, I'm going to lean towards you on this next one. We are meeting here or at the pickup. Can I please be just to say it real quick? Um, if you can be in the parade with us, we need you desperately. We're trying to work out transportation. So if you have a van or if you have a big suburban or something that could carry lots of people, we would like to, to des designate a pickup place because somebody needs to make a trip or two to our spot in the parade. And it is number 18, but I'll actually, um, Friday I'll go by and see where number 18 is. And I'll put a notice out that it's at such and such an address. You can Google it and come straight to it. You just can't drive there because you can't leave cars. So we need somebody, if there's anybody that wants to, to pick up a group and drive us there, uh, then you get out and stay at the float. At the end of the parade, that same person needs to be down at the post office to pick people up and carry them back to wherever you left your cars. That is real confusing, so please stop and talk to either one of us if you need more information on how to do that or how to help us do that. Good morning, everyone. Um, for those that have been following along on the Beth page and here on Sunday mornings, um, it's been our stewardship season, and that all culminates today with Generosity Sunday. And so by that, we would love for you to provide your pledge cards, your pledges for 2023. At the time of the offertory, you can just put it in the offertory plate, please. Um, does anyone need one? Perhaps it's hanging out on your table at home. Um, my assistant... Heather Goodman was going to help, but, um, okay, <clears throat> um, we've got a few in the back. Heather, Lucy, you want to help? You want to help hand out cards? Yes? Okay. Lucy's going to help hand out cards. Anybody that needs a card, she has a stack. I've got some more up here, so you've got at least three back there. Oh, you're coming here, Lucy. Okay. Hold on. Here. 
Um, so th while they're handing those out, oh, just quickly uh, kind of summarize what we talked about um, the past month. So we focused on really Garrett and I were talking about what should we do for stewardship campaign this year, and we really wanted to answer one main question, uh, and that's why do we have a stewardship campaign? I think we all understand why we give a pledge and why we tithe, why we give money, give a portion of what is God's back to him, right? Um, but why do we have a campaign? And really there are two main reasons we talked about, one being very logistical. We really need these cards to make a budget for the church for next year. We need to have an understanding kind of of what to expect to be coming in so we can kind of make a plan for how we're going to use those resources God has granted us, right, for next year. Um, the other is a very spiritual reason um, for each one of us individually, and that's to, that at least once per year, we should have a conversation with God about our finances. I know for most people, finances is not necessarily the most fun topic. I'm weird, and I love it. Um, I actually love to listen to financial podcasts while I run. I know that makes me weird, not you guys. Um, but to help frame that conversation this year, we talked about the treasure principle. So that's why this has been up here the whole time. It's not because we have, you know, pirates amongst us or anything like that. The treasure principle simply states, you can't take it with you, so when, when, you, when you die, but you can't sit it on a head, right? It's based on Matthew 6.20, I believe, which is store your treasures in heaven. And there are a number of principles that are part of that. Um, but ultimately, the premise is what we give to God now um, we're saving for the future, for eternity. But the best thing about giving for God is that unlike, you know, saving for retirement or saving for your children or anything like that where you are delaying gratification, right? The best thing here is you get both. We're, you have delayed gratification in eternity for the things you have stored up, the treasures you have stored up in heaven, but you also get to experience the joy of giving now, right? The joy that... Your, your funds, your money, what it turns into. And it turns into food in a community garden. It turns into clean clothes for those that need it. It turns into a house of worship to share the Holy Spirit and love of Jesus Christ, right, in this community, this growing community. Um, so that's why it's so important to, to give now, to give back um, a bit of what we've been entrusted to, to keep for God. So um, thank you again for um, joining us this year um, and look forward to, to handing these. And one thing I almost forgot I hope you flipped over and looked on the back of the cards this year because we're excited to announce that we fully have a new way to give for, for the, the foreseeable future, and that is digitally, using an app called Tithely. You can download that in your Google Play Store, Apple Store. Um, it's, it's in there. You create an account. Uh, you can search, and you'll be able to find Beth Page Presbyterian Church. Luckily, we are the only Beth Page Presbyterian Church in there. The other one down the road, you won't get confused. It's not in there, just us. Um, you could also take out your mobile phone, get your camera out, and scan this QR code on the back. We are going to eventually have some of those cards in the pew, so you can do that at any point. And it'll take you directly to the website where you can give to Beth Page. You don't have to even search. It'll take you right there. Um, I would encourage you to, to link it to your bank account. That's a little cheaper for fees for the church. Um, but I'm happy to talk through any questions you may have about Tithely, how it works, um, well, how we recommend using it, how perhaps you could cover the fees if you were interested in doing that, covering it for the church. Um, so please see me and ask me any questions. Um, you can set up recurring gifts. That's actually how mine is. Mine comes out the 15th of every month now. So my offering is going to come out on Tuesday, actually, of this week, um, because it just automatically, automatically happens. So we're really excited about this, um, this new way of giving. Of course, we're still going to accept cash, check, all those fun things. But, you know, for, for good millennials like myself who have that much cash in their wallet, this is an exciting new way to give to Beth Page. okay? So thank you all. Yes. Sure. Thank you. 
Let us prepare our hearts to worship God. Let us pray. O oh, gracious God, we ask that you would calm us, center us, take away anything that might separate us from you, strengthen us and encourage us that we might serve you all of our days. In Christ's name, amen. Please stand and let us sing together, Shout to the Lord. Please join me for the call to worship. This is the day that the Lord has made. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord and shout with joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us worship God.
You may be seated. Some of us break the rules for right living and know we are sinners. Others keep all the rules but realize that our relationships with God and others are not really as they should be. Some of us think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. Others do not appreciate their own worth as God's children, nor live in the confidence of God's love. Most of us, when faced with a choice between security and venturing into dangerous unknown paths where God has called us, are reluctant to take the risk of faith. All of us are invited to name our sins and seek God's forgiveness. Let us come to God as we are, recognizing how unworthy we are to approach the one who embraces the universe, yet believing that we are known and welcomed in God's awesome presence. Let us confess our sins using the prayer of confession on the screen. I'll say the words, and then there's time for silence. O oh Lord, hear our prayers as we confess the rules for right living that we've broken. Forgive our mistakes in relating to others. Help us see ourselves as you see us. Give us the courage we need to invest in your service. Forgive us when we have fallen short of your will for our lives. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. Amen. We do not need to be weighed down and oppressed by our own poor choices. Friends, your burdens are no more. Forgiveness in Christ Jesus is real. Go and allow goodness and love to encompass you this day. Your sins are forgiven.
Would the children come forward? So we're going to sit right here today. Thank you. Oh, here's here's the offering plate. There you go. Guy, here you go. Why is there a guy so slippery? I don't know. Somebody put one in there one time. Come on up. Good morning. I do. Here, Lucy, do you want to put some offering in the offering plate? Thank you. Thank you. It's a different microphone, and it's not working very well. Good morning. How are you? Look what I have up here. Do you see this? What is it? Treasure. Treasure. Now, what does it remind you of? What? Jesus? Well, that's a good answer, but how does the treasure remind you of Jesus? Yes, Guy? The Bahamas. Okay. Because of pirates? Okay. It does kind of look like a pirate's treasure chest, doesn't it? But you know why it's there in church? Let me tell you. <coughs> It is there because we all have treasure. We have treasure. Now, treasure is like money. Now, you have your parents have money to buy food. This is golden, that's right. Would you like to hold one? Okay. Okay. It is plastic. It's not real money. It's pretend. No, that's okay. There you go. Here, did you get one, Cyrus? You don't want one? I'll just put it there. Did you get one, Lucy? Okay. Everybody get one? Davis, do you have one? Okay. Everybody look at this coin and think about why would we want to give it to the church if it was real money? Why? Yes. Great answer. Guy said just Guy said to raise money for hunger and then Evie said to raise money for everything. So let me tell you what our the church spends money on. Okay. See all the lights up there? That is electricity. We have to pay the electric company, don't we? Yes, we do. to make the church look nice. That's right. What else do we do with the money? I know you, you've been out there, the community garden. Do you remember it? We use money to help us in the community garden, maybe buy fertilizer or seeds. What about the playground, that's right. We just got the playground redone, remember? And now it's safe for everybody to play. Can also, so can you also have to pay the, ta the tax bill? Okay. I don't think the church has to pay taxes, but each person in the church has to pay their own taxes. We also give money away so that other people will know about Jesus. That's right. That's right. So will you hold this coin and think about giving money to the church for God's work? Okay. Will you pray with me? Dear God, we thank you for the church, which is the people, us. And we thank you that we can give money. We thank you to help do your work. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you want to give me your gold coin, you can. If you want to keep it, you can. Either one. I'm going to keep it. That's fine. You may. Do you want...
Please bow your heads now and pray with me for the illumination of the Holy Spirit. Our Heavenly Father, we often cannot know or understand your love and care for us. It seems sometimes as if all around us threatens and overwhelms. Please send the Holy Spirit to give us light, to give us understanding, to comfort and warm us. As always, we pray these things in the name of and for the sake of Jesus the Christ, our risen Lord and only Savior. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning is from the Psalms, Psalm 28. This is taken from the book Psalms Now. Listen for the word of God. O oh God, I am crying for help. This is not a pious exclamation. I mean it. I'm desperate. If you don't listen, I'll go down the drain. Don't let me float downstream with those who ignore you. I know they will go over the edge if they persist in their course of rebelliousness and indifference. Reach out, O oh God, and snatch me from this overpowering current lest I perish with them. I thank you, O God. You have heard my agonizing cry. I called for you, and you responded. You are my hope and my salvation. I will sing your praises forever, and thus the Lord is the hope and salvation of all who trust him. Stay close to those who struggle, O God. Never let them go. And the New Testament lesson is found in Matthew 14, 22 to 33. Listen to this familiar story. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but by this time the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came walking toward them on the sea, 
But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and started walking on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, The wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the reading. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O Lord, open our hearts to hear your message to us this day. Help me not to get in the way of your spirit. In Christ's name, amen. Now, as some of you know, I love boating and water skiing. Now, sometimes I used to take my friend Gloria boating. She grew up with a boat on Lake Wiley and loves boating as much as I do. Now, she's about eight years older than I am and is much larger than I am. Well, the boat was tied to a dock, and I'm in the bow of the boat, and I hold Gloria's hands, and she steps down into the boat. And off we go for a day of fun on the lake. And after a picnic lunch and a great time, we head back to the dock. Now, once I had us all tied up to the dock, I proceeded to unload. I took out the ice chest and the boat bag that has our sunscreen and towels, hopping on and off the boat. And Gloria tried to get out at the bow, but it was too hard. And then she went to the back of the boat, and she could get one leg up, but she couldn't raise the other leg over the side of the boat. I mean, she was stiff and the opposite of agile. Well, she put her leg back in the boat, and after several more attempts at climbing out, she sat back down on the seat and said, I guess I'm stuck in the boat. At first, I laughed, but then I realized she was serious. So I pushed and pulled and gave suggestions, and after several more attempts at different places in the boat, she finally was able to get out. Stuck in the boat. The disciples are stuck in the boat. The boat is safe. Where the disciples are, it's secure and comfortable. I mean, compared to the rough seas and the high waves and the gale force winds of the storm. Now, if you get out of the boat, no matter what boat you may be in, you are more likely to sink. But if you don't get out of the boat, there is guaranteed certainty that you will never walk on water. As John Ortborg puts it in his book, if you want to walk on water, you got to get out of the boat. He goes on to say that something, someone inside inside us tells us that there's more to life than just sitting in the boat. You were made for something more than merely avoiding failure. 
There is something inside you that wants to walk on water, to leave the comfort of routine existence and abandon yourself to the high adventure of following God. Did you notice what Jesus says to the disciples when they see him walking on water? The disciples see him and cry out in fear, it's a ghost. And then Jesus in the NRSV says, take heart. It is I, do not be afraid. Now, I double-checked, and every English version that I could find uses the phrase, it is I. Well, that means in English, we miss it. The Greek actually says, I am. Get it? God's name. Remember back when Moses asked at the burning bush, who should I say sent me? God says, I am. Jesus is literally walking on the water and is basically saying God's name, I am. Jesus is saying, I am God. In case there was any doubt about who could and was, walking on water. You remember the story of Elijah in the Old Testament? He's on the mountain, and Elijah is told that the Lord is about to pass by and to go out and stand on the mountain. And God isn't in the fire. God isn't in the wind or the earthquake, but passes by in the sound of a still, small voice. Or as the NRSV puts it, in the sound of sheer silence. Maybe Jesus intended to pass by when he was walking on the water for there to be a theophany, which means an appearance of God. Theophany, there on the water. And then when questioned about who he is, Jesus simply answers, God, or I am. But then Peter, Peter says, if you command me to come out to you, I will. But the rest of the disciples, they're quiet. Now, we know about Peter, and lots of sermons have focused on Peter's impetuousness, on his faith, on his ability to put his mouth in gear before thinking. But today, I want us to think about the other disciples. What do you think kept them in the boat? Fear of sinking? What kept them from slipping overboard after Peter? There was a bit of safety in the boat. As Ortberg points out, we all have our boats. Something that for us represents safety and security apart from God. A boat is anything other than God where we put our trust when life gets stormy. Ortberg writes, your boat is whatever keeps you comfortable, so comfortable that you don't want to give it up, even if it's keeping you from joining Jesus on the waves. Your boat is whatever pulls you away from extreme discipleship. Your boat may be something good like a commitment to grandchildren or financial security or remaining in your own home. Your boat may be seeking someone else's approval. For a woman named Beth, it was her mom. Beth did everything 
in order to keep her mom happy. She raised her kids the way her mom thinks she should. She committed to her job the way her mom wanted her to. She keeps her house the way her mom wants it. <laughs> the irony is, though, her mom isn't happy. Nothing Beth can ever do will be good enough to please her mom. Her mom's approval is a pretty leaky vessel, which terrifies her. But that is her boat. Do you have a boat that you refuse to get out of? Is staying in the boat keeping you from living your fullest life close to Jesus? Many years ago, my mother-in-law, Maxine, had a gorgeous set of china, which she proudly displayed in the china cabinet. She told me of how it was given to her mother one piece at a time when the family was impoverished during the Depression. She told how her mother told her to take care of it, for it is a precious gift and irreplaceable. And I asked Maxine if her mother used the china. Oh no, Maxine said, it might get broken. And so I asked her if she had ever used it. Oh no, she said, I'd be afraid. My mother is dead and gone, but if a piece got chipped or broken, I would never forgive myself. And I looked at her kind of with a question, and she said, well, maybe I would chance it for a special occasion. But now, Maxine is dead and gone, and there was a never an occasion deemed special enough to use the china. I mean, that china, as far as I know, has never been used. I began to think of the gifts that God has given us, using the china, using God's gifts, come with a risk. But sometimes there's a greater risk. The gift is so valuable, it must be risked. If not, the tragedy is that the gift would forever be unused. If a gift is never used, it thwarts the intention of the giver. God does not just give us gifts so that we can acknowledge them, but never risk enough to use them. Did God give the gift of stepping out in faith? Maybe even walking on water to those other disciples? Maybe. But they never took the risk to even try. Those disciples, as Ortberg notes, were very much aware of the cost of getting out of the boat. They were in touch with the pain of potential failure, of embarrassment, of inadequacy, of criticism, and perhaps even loss of life. But they were not so aware of the cost of staying in the boat. We sometimes are like that, like Maxine, when and anticipating using our gifts. Like Maxine, when we play the when-then game. When there is a very, very special occasion, then I will use the china. When I feel confident, I'll try using this gift. When my spouse is on the same page as I am, then I will work on our partnership. When I get to be a better speaker, then I'll take that position of leadership. 
The truth is that we can, like Maxine, wait our whole lives and the when never comes. John Ortberg nicknames the disciples who stay in the boat, boat potatoes. You know, kind of like couch potatoes. He calls them boat potatoes. He says that the cost of being a boat potato is lack of growth. Think of the big moments in life. A young person gets their driver's license. One day, they're a walker or a rider. And the next day, they're a driver. That's growth. Or think of a wedding. One day, the man is only responsible to and for himself. And the next day, he is a husband. That's growth. If you don't grow, you become stagnant. You forget your dreams. You may look back and see missed opportunities, and you may realize there is desperate need in the world, and you are not a part of it. You won't look back and regret not having watched more TV or not having rested more. But you may look back and regret your lack of growth. Growth is hard. It's risky. And there are no guarantees. But without growth, we do not reach our potential. We do not use our gifts. And we become stuck in the boat. You know, we Protestants have a strong work ethic. And sometimes our sin is that we work too hard and are too focused on getting things done. But other times, even though we are slow to admit it, our sin is just the opposite. We are content to sit on the sofa, glued to the TV, watching the game or the game shows, or the soap operas, or the hospital drama, not accomplishing a thing. Now, I do not believe that our worth is determined by what we get done. But we in this culture now seldom talk about not getting anything done or sloth. Sloth, it's an old-fashioned word. In the early church, it was taken so seriously by Christians that it was listed as one of the seven deadly sins. It's the only one of the seven deadly sins that is not specifically spiritual. That is because the Judeo-Christian tradition understood human beings as responsible to God. Our lives are not about, and I want to, I want to, like if I could capitalize this or put this on a bulletin board or a billboard, I would. Our lives are not about self-preservation. Our lives are not about self-fulfillment as much as our culture says otherwise. But our lives are to be about service and acts of stewardship. Again, Ortberg writes, to fail to be good stewards of what God has given us is a form of robbing him. Sloth can coexist with much busyness. It's not the same as physical laziness. I love this definition. Sloth at its core consists of loss of meaning, purpose, and hope, coupled with indifference 
to the welfare of others. It is the opposite of zeal and joy in service to God. Someone once imagined that the entrance to heaven had a big movie screen with a film rolling called What Might Have Been. And before you get to go into heaven, you have to watch what God might have done with your life if only you had been willing. What he would, done, would have done with your family. What God would have done with your finances. With your gifts. If you had just been willing to step out of the boat. Now, I don't know if that's a good image or not, but I do know that it's not too late for us to get out of the boat. For if we don't take the risk, none of us will ever walk on water. Amen. I invite you to stand and let us say what we believe using the We come to a time for our morning offering, a time where we give. And now go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor everyone. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you, this day, and forevermore. Amen.